Hello, Cosimo. Welcome to the Creative Science Podcast. Hi, Georgie, yeah, and thanks for having me. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. It, in this summer, it's uh, it's crazy. Only the hardworking people at MVRDV are available for interviews because uh, all the rest are in holidays. <laughs> well, yeah, true. But also here, people are like, um, yeah, the office is like quite empty every day. So, but yeah, it's a, it's, it's a pleasure, you know, being here. No so, matter when in the year. Summer, yeah, yeah. I'll always be available for you. So we have another guest uh, tuning in from Rotterdam, and um, I got uh, I, I I followed your account uh, on Instagram a long time ago. I saw your account, and I somehow I don't know. I felt like I've heard about you or something like that. And then uh, Ricardo Piazzai, who was also on the podcast. Um, he told me, yeah, can I suggest some more people for the podcast? I said, yeah, sure. And then he told me about you. And uh, so I just look for people in Instagram. And then I found you. I was like, yeah, yeah, I know this guy. And uh, finally, we managed. So um, you can introduce yourself a little bit, what you do uh, to the people that don't know yet about you. Okay, well, thanks. I... Uh, yeah, I'll take this opportunity to, to thank Ricardo then. Uh, I didn't know he was the connection. Um, well, I'm uh, an architect. I'm like uh, an innovator and an artist. Uh, you know, I do uh, something which is like uh, pretty much in between or uh, uh, all these uh, fields, these realms. I've been working in MBRDB for uh, yeah six years already. Uh, before that, I was in Paris. And um, yeah, I do have like my own uh, practice, which is like my side project. Uh, and yeah, I yeah, I'm like very happy to you know share a little bit of what I know uh, with like your community. That's awesome. Uh, we figured out that also we have some camaraderie because we studied at the same university. Uh, just yeah. uh, when you were about to finish, I was about to start. Um, I so I'm. Huh? Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, so I'm curious, like I ask, always ask this question to everyone because uh, I think it's very important to understand. Um, how did you come up with the idea that you wanted to become an architect, a designer to try to do this professionally? Was uh, some people have somebody in their family or was you personally that were, I don't know, attracted towards this field? How did this happen? Um, well, uh, no, I, like my family, like it's a longer line of uh, doctors, so it's completely different. I've been the, the black sheep, you know, in the house, in the yeah, but um, since I was a kid, I was always been uh, fascinated by uh, you know, this uh, the science fiction and you know, these images of the future, how the future might look like. So then, at a certain point of my life, I said, like to myself, okay, what's the profession that allow me to you know, contribute? Uh, to this kind of vision. So how can I do something for, uh, you know, the people, for the world, for, you know, the cities? And uh, yeah, that's uh, that after like a very small research, I, you know, understood that architecture was a uh, thing. And uh, I just dived into it. And that was like uh, my true love, I must say. It was a perfect match. Uh, so you start, you're, are you from Rome or are you from somewhere else in Italy? No, I'm from uh, Monte Rubiano, which is like a very little tiny village in the market countryside. So it's the same height of Rome, but on the other coast. So it's 600 people village. Ah, it's a very small one. And then yeah, it's uh, pretty much the size of MBRDB. <laughs> yeah. And then you moved to Rome to study. Yeah. Um, what was the. Um, imagination versus reality situation back then like uh where your imagination about what is studying architecture covered or was it quite different no it was completely different so likely enough i was i found a, um, a room uh near the maxi you know the zaha museum so i thought that that was what we will be doing for the coming like five years but none of that was, uh, uh, you know, matched with the professors and, uh, you know, with the studios. But um, yeah, I was like, um, yeah, it was it was a little bit shocking, you know, because uh, I imagined like a completely different world. I was like, you know, uh, imagining that we will be building this future, uh, futuristic looking, uh, you know, architecture, cities uh, and things. But it was, I don't know, shocking for me because the university was like rather conservative. 
uh, in that sense. So the professor were teaching us what they have been told, I don't know, 50, 60 years earlier. So I felt it was a sort of like a limit or a glass ceiling that you couldn't be uh, broken in a mm. way. But then, yeah, I found my way uh, through the library. So I spent like an insane amount of time in the library of the university looking for, uh, you know, all MBRDV, OMA uh, publication, you know, and uh, like, um, yeah, that's that's how I like I try to, you know, develop myself as a like more contemporary or future looking art. I spend a, a big t uh amount of hours in that library too and then in the library here in frankfurt but then i was just sitting there with my laptop and uh, going through google maps i had a very interesting way of looking for architectural offices for example i would know that there are a lot of architectural offices in rotterdam and i would go in rotterdam on google maps and write architects in rotterdam and go through all their websites and i didn't uh, probably read that much but i was and i would save all the websites in my favorites um, and this is how I discovered a lot of offices and, uh, and then I would look for them in the websites online. So I was the more digital, <laughs> digital okay. era, a way of researching. Um, and I, mm, I started architecture for a little bit more practical thing because I wanted to do, you know, in Italy, mm, I'm, I'm coming from, originally from Bulgaria. I grew up in Italy and became Italian culturally and by passport uh, but um, because it's a land where there are a lot of need of connection in order to get a good job i thought architects have to know how to do stuff so there will be needing of some people that have the competence to, to bring <laughs> things forward and this was my 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 idea behind it and uh, my cousin was already studying architecture and so also some um, the son of a friend of a, my mom was studying architecture and I dis discovered these futuristic looking things too, like Zaha Hadid and uh, uh, Daniel Lie Liebeskin and um, uh, Frank Gehry. And they studied at the Liceo Artistico in Italy, this high school of art. So there also I learned a little bit. And then when I started uh, studying architecture and discovering more and more architects and also especially from the north of Europe, my taste for architecture changed. And Zahadid, from being my one of my favorite architects, or Frank Gehry, from being one of my favorite architects, uh, went to be the least favorite <laughs> architects. How, how was that for you? How do you see the, like, is for you, uh, is your concept or your, your view of architecture, how has that matured through your personal exploration and research? Yeah, so when, when I mean, when like back then, you, uh, the library university, you know, I was like super fascinated by Japanese architects. You know, what like, uh, you know, Sana was able to do to me was like, uh, you know, amazing. You know, these like very thin shells and, you know, like almost you know, super light structure. So that was uh, initially, you know, my first love. And then, uh, yeah, again, I, I, I dived into um, SML Excel from OMA and then uh, um, KM3 from uh, MBRDV. And then I understood that, um, so I like there learned uh, what uh, uh, pragmatism is. And then that was, uh, you know, love at the first sight. And uh, I never abandoned it, you know, to me, it's, the way to approach design it's uh yeah i don't know i remember like uh you know holding my hands came three and bring it everywhere with me and it's like this super thick book that uh you know you don't want to bring around uh, with you but uh you know to me it was just like a bible you know I, I i have a joke about that book um but you're uh, you're like um Opposite to what I say in the joke, because also in some of my videos from Copenhagen, we went in a, the library of the Danish Architecture Museum mm -hmm. and there was the um, SML Excel book. And I said, this is the book that every architect has, but nobody reads. It's just okay. because it looks good <laughs> and it's very thick. Uh, and um, so, yeah, what were like the what captivated you from this approach? What were the lessons learned from this first books? Also, like um, I think Rem Colas um, 
I've read his book that it's a very interesting book. It's only in Italian, but it's from Rem Colas. It's called Junk Space. Um, yeah, it's cool. it's a it's his books are not easy to understand yeah. and digest. You know, it's a very particular way of language. It's not straightforward. No, no. I mean, he's like a very you know, he's a clever guy, and uh, you know, I'm not clever enough to understand the whole he's saying. But uh, you know, it's fascinating for me because they also lay the foundation of uh, what is like the, the the northern European design nowadays. You know, and uh, this kind of uh, if you think about like how many people uh, of this like famous architect like passed through OMA, uh, you know, somehow, and you know the, the you know the legacy of OMA, I think is still uh, visible also in theory. Uh, and you know, like for instance, the uh, two of the three partners here in VRTV, they came from OMA, they where they learned. Uh, you know, this first uh, programmatic and uh, pragmatic and diplomatic uh, uh, approach of architecture. And uh, yeah, to me, it's uh, it's pretty much the same in the sense that what uh, I see um, a lot here is that with every project, we try to contribute to like a new world or like better world or like more uh, resilient or, um, uh, you know, democratic world. So that's, that's what like been fascinating me uh, from the very beginning. You know, the thing that you can do to, like, uh, how do you say, communicate a way of living or to propose a way of living or to, you know, facilitate a way of living. You know, the, 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 the way you arrange the program in my shape people's lives and people behaviors or like how you design a piece of infrastructure, you know, it changed drastically, you know, the way people, um, you know, live. So I see a lot of uh, VR Kingle's book uh, back there. And, uh, you know, he always says that, uh, you know, for his uh, child, uh, the a power plant is going to be like a fun building, you know, because they just reinvented the technology. So it's, uh, yeah, that, that's, I think, the true goal of architecture. Yeah, this is why, for example, what I've learned by studying these architects in my own way, um, exactly because when I started reading a book, um, like the Rem Collas books or many of the architectural books. Um, I always liked authors that have a very straight, straight up language. So if you, if you read Cities, from Peop uh, Cities for People from Young Gale, it's yeah. the simplest book that even a non-architect can read it and understand what is it about. And um I understood better like the images, so I would just go uh, download all the images and read a little bit about the project, but not too much, and then re reverse engineer it and then understand, oh, they did this like this. And then I, I also love the books of um, Bruno Munari because he explains how you actually can use uh, design no like for example uh, speaking of your of the office you work in vrdv they do all these houses that have this typical house shape but they then do them in these very strong colors mm -hmm. and then you take an element that it's usually tradition and you wrap it into this very strong color and you have suddenly a completely new paradigm of of and then you and what i why why i changed my way of seeing architecture in different ways exactly this that there is always this base of functionality and this framework for life as you call it like you set up some some ways the the space in the architecture so that you guide the user to live in this mm -hmm. new way and this was um, and this is how i how i started loving more architects mm -hmm. like Bjork Ingels, uh, MVRDV, uh, some projects of OMA I love a lot, uh, all the Scandinavian like Kobe that also come from, it's sort of like uh, um, OMA started this first row of offices, then there were other offices that people worked there and then they interpreted. Exactly. And how did you, how did you end up from, from Rome to Rotterdam? Well, at a certain point, I said uh, to myself, because I was uh, always, uh, I said, like intrigued by this idea of, uh, you know, like having like a vision, having a radical vision for the future, uh, 
then you know the, the as you said in Italy they're looking for different kind of uh, um, architects in a way so after spending like some time uh, working with uh, this uh, very close friend of mine Paolo Vendurella doing like he, he came back from uh, big uh, and then he had like a strong vision about architecture that's where I also uh, learned a lot of you know 3d modeling uh, uh, also programmatic approach and then uh, you know a certain point uh, I said like okay I I want to have also an uh, international experience. Then I applied to Clément Blaché in Paris. He's a former uh, OMA guy. And uh, yeah, it was really nice, really nice. The East was like very open to every possible like type of um, like approaches. And uh, and there I got the, um, like a call from MVRDV. And you know, these are the, 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 the calls that you cannot uh, say no to. And I took the first uh, train to from Paris to Rotterdam, and yeah, well, it changed my life. So I, I'm here, and uh, I'm gonna stay. How, um, like, uh, another thing that I'm always curious about is because I have experienced it myself. It, um, how was for you mov moving abroad from Italy to Paris and then to the Netherlands, and also not only in terms of career because of course you learn different approaches in different um, countries but um also from the personal personal life point of view were there some cultural shock that uh, you had to get used to or overcome when moving to different parts of the world i mean of course at first i was scared like hell i think it's a common feeling you know moving to completely different uh, uh, you know city and I don't speak any French, so the, the, it was like a kind of a, a hard uh, thing for me to move to a country where I was able to speak, uh, you know, the, the language. But uh, I, I must say, you know, the, it was after a while this disappeared. I mean, I got lost in like this gigantic city. You know, I come from like a very tiny village and, uh, you know, I got to Paris, which is pretty much limitless. And, uh, you know, I've been like meeting with like people from all the possible uh, background. So that that was amazing. I mean, I, I cannot imagine, you know, to anymore to live in a different condition. You know, it's yeah, and in the Netherlands as well. I mean, when I came from Paris to Rotterdam, I was also, um, yeah, like kind of afraid of the transition, you know, scaling down to like a smaller city with a totally different uh, view. But then I, I found myself like amazed by, by, by the Netherlands and by Rotterdam. You know, the creative industry here is so powerful that you meet people from every possible background with every possible story. And, you know, it's, it, it's amazing. It's like a continuous thing, uh, you know, at the bar or at the museum, or in the office, you know, even in the street, you meet with someone who has like a, I don't know, like a wonderful story to tell. Yeah, That's totally. Fun. Totally. For me, it was also a little bit like um, amazing in Europe, how different is the culture, although it's so close theoretically, right? You mm -hmm. fly just one hour from Rome to Paris and then the culture changes completely. And then you do, I don't know, a couple of hours train ride to the Netherlands and the people are also completely different thing. This is something amazing here. Mm. And in Germany also, like I had to adapt so much to the local culture because, um, you know, people have this cliche that Germans are very squared. And in the beginning, I didn't think so. But then there were some moments where they came across like this. And then I understood with time that they are not... Um, they're very direct and uh, honest with you. So they don't tell you something that they don't really think. And that's why they come across like uh, very rude sometimes. So if you tell them like, let's do this and they cannot do it, they won't tell you, yeah, we're going to do it. They say, no, I don't have time. And <laughs> this is weird. So did you have some moments like this in while living abroad where you thought, oh, this was some weird and then with time you understood the culture or stuff like that absolutely absolutely the, 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 the Dutch people are like also very much direct and very much informal so like coming from Italy where like formality it's like a must you know in a country where like um, yeah like basically no one is uh, it's ever formal you know it was amazing you know also the way you communicate with uh, with like I don't know the, the partner here you know it's very much 
like friendly, you know, it's, you don't call, I mean, you call them by the name, you don't call them like architect as you will do in Italy. And uh, at the beginning it was shocking, but uh, you know, in a good sense. And uh, I must say, I also became like more and more direct, more and more Dutch. Uh, and I, I actually love the way they live, you know, they're very much uh, open and uh, free, you know, it's, it's, it's lovely. It's, I would say, very much different from, um, you know, the, the, the Italian way of living. But yeah, I, I, I love it. I mean, I, yeah. And I, I, um, how was the start at uh, MVRDV? So you applied for this job, you got this call, moved there. Yeah, what, I applied what? for an open position, actually, uh, six years ago for an architect position. And I think like two months after I received the call uh because there was something wrong with my email uh i couldn't get the 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 email from them and then at a certain point like someone called me saying like hey why not reply i was like what are you talking about and uh, <laughs> and then uh, yeah they did like over the phone we spoke about uh, you know the offer the job the thing and then uh yeah eventually i got the email and uh, yeah i accepted right away and uh yeah like run like literally from uh, from from Paris here it's uh, I, and it, it, this is how like everybody gets in the office eh? it's like a true like a, a application so you if there is no position that suits you just I'll suggest to apply and uh, maybe they will that, that position open up in like two months has happened for me and uh, you know you'll get the call back mm. so yeah it's yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's like really, you know, uh, open process again. And yeah, so it's, yeah, it's really nice. And um, what were your, do you, do you still have that portfolio you applied with? I do. I do. And um, yeah, I mean, I don't think it's uh, outdated uh, uh, still because it was just telling them what I was good at. So it's, full of blue foam massing studies, all possible rhino tricks, uh, good render, good diagrams. I don't think I even had like one floor plan or section, like mm. barely any 2D. But yeah, and yeah, that's what I've been doing also for the first years here. It was like, a, you know, kind of a, the, the 3D guy, you know, doing a lot of uh, tests with rhino, you know, grasshopper, whatever, but it was just about showing that kind of thing. And I think this is the secret to getting one of these office is that you should show that you are an expert in something. doesn't really matter what you are an expert in. You know, I was, let's say, expert on massing studies, blue foam, like, uh, you know, like very beginning part of the, the process. And uh, yeah, and it was like what they were searching for at a certain point. And if you are an expert in Revit, computational design, like visualization, we have all these departments, so you just simply apply and then you get uh, selected and then you start working like, you know, what you like to, to do the most. If you if you want, I always try to do this sort of challenge with all the people that I know that worked at uh, Zahadi, that big, at... So I ask everybody if they want, if they feel okay, you can send me your portfolio. I'm going to be putting it on an Instagram of the sure Creative thing. Insider sure podcast so that uh, people when they feel I think um, I'm a person that I'm very uh, I wouldn't say brave but I don't care that much about what people will think about me uh, so I when I started looking for an internship I wouldn't make myself too many uh, problems or asking myself questions about my portfolio I would just do a portfolio send it send it send it and go to applications and this is how it worked out for me and so I think that some people have this um, anxious feeling that uh, if it's not perfect it's not okay so they never send the portfolio because they're afraid and I mean, the worst thing that can happen is that you're not working there. You'll keep not working there. <laughs> so yeah. so I want to email, show right? what kind of portfolios people send to, to these offices. To And I send it to many offices um, also from Rotterdam, like OMA and stuff. But um, because I didn't have the budget to live there on an internship, I was like, okay, this is not fitting for me right now. Uh, but it's interesting to see what kind of portfolios get people into these offices so that 
if somebody wants to apply, they maybe get inspired or, you know, say I'm at this level or not yet. I have to work a little bit. So, yeah, it's interesting. And, no, absolutely. Uh, yeah. No, no, I think it's like being specific, it's the only thing that matter, you know, I mean, I, I will be bored as hell to do, you know, I don't know, uh, details, uh, you know, like very advanced phases, you know, and then I think like the, 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 the portfolio I send, it re really reflect me and, uh, you know, the, the things I wanted to do uh, back then, you know, and was I would good diet. So that's, that will be my suggestion to the people, not be afraid to not put floor plans in or like a diagrams or you know just if you're good at the detail just put details only you know just uh you know don't be afraid to show what you like and what you want you know yeah. because otherwise you will be you know somehow stuck in working like i don't know in a thing that you don't like you know and then this is uh, yeah shouldn't happen for anybody and can be only one thing like can be like one project that you think this is like I, I this is my opinion like for example if you have done some project that has been very broad and you've done specific things and you think this project is what represents you you don't have to put like 25 projects in your portfolio just because somebody said so it yeah, can yeah, be exactly. one thing that catch the eye of of the people that are doing it um and how did you evolve like so you arrive as this uh rhino expert uh concept design expert uh what was can you share about like some of the projects that you maybe work on maybe some of them were already built so you're not <laughs> you're not under non-disclosure uh, yeah, yeah there are many i mean and uh if you go on mbrdv website and check for uh like my name there are all the project uh, i've been working on um and well yeah i i started with uh you know this uh i think that the, you know the the massing studies is like a typical uh north european way of approaching architecture you know something that probably in italy at university especially rome you know i didn't know i just like look at these things in books and um and then i mean i uh, started learning a lot about uh, uh mbrdv um theory you know and methodology as well uh, like reading other books and the Y Factory books, uh, you know, to explore the whole uh, spectrum of uh, uh, MBRDV theory. And then I try to, you know, absorb uh, these things. And also because the communication with the founding partner here is very easy. You always have them involved in every single uh, decision in the project. So it was very easy for me to absorb more of, uh, um, you know, the, the, yeah, the, the MBRDV DNA methodology and and ideas and then yeah basically i've grown i grown in uh, into like a project leader position so i'm now uh way less involved in the in the rhino making but uh, more on the controlling on the overviewing and uh, management of the project so yeah from uh basically from rhino to outlook that's uh that's uh, how my software uh skills evolved <laughs> and a uh, snipping tool it's a very important yeah exactly exactly that, that's fundamental yeah. <laughs> snipping tool and if you start drawing quite well with the mouse of your computer then you're very, very high level yeah, yeah exactly but that's that's i mean if i will uh, need to do a portfolio right now that's probably what i will put in you know the the the, the snipping tools a screenshot you know yeah 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 <laughs> totally uh and um but uh, maybe because you started collaborating uh, very early on with um, your friend, I forgot his name, Paolo, you said he's called? Yes, Paolo Vendurella, yes. Yeah, um, so you basically, is it since then that you have always had this uh, side hustle, so to say, that it's your personal practice and your personal personal design projects? Yeah, basically with Paolo, we had like a sort of uh, um, like architectural office, but then like uh, simultaneously we were doing like some art um, and we were doing like, uh, yeah, very different things. And um, so it was, yeah, it was really nice. I learned from him a lot, uh, both on the realm of architecture and the realm of art. Um, so we also started like a startup, which didn't uh, take off. Uh, it was about uh, making uh, urban furniture like smart. So we will attach uh, solar panels, uh, music boosters and things. Uh, we tried, but the municipality were not daring enough to buy the concept. 
So we tried to do prototypes. We went to uh, Milan uh, Design Week. You know, we've been like in several places, but you know, I don't know, the, all, all the, the municipality we've been uh, um, talking to, you know, they weren't daring enough to buy the whole concept. Uh, so we've been building like also this prototype in the city, you know, letting people in Rome to use them and see how better life will be. You know, if you can charge your phone everywhere, if you have, uh, you know, like a music booster for a party, you know, in the bench at the park. And um, so, yeah, we were like kind of also, we also wanted to promote like a certain lifestyle, you know, uh, and the idea of living. That's also then I combined with the Dutch way of uh, of living and approaching and the way like Northern uh, European people do art, which is like much more um, related to environmental issue. You know, if you think about like all of our Elias and one for all. Uh, so I was like extremely fascinated. And and then at a certain point I, I said to myself, architecture is wonderful but uh, it's it's also a wonderful medium to um, communicate change and uh, um, you know like a idea of uh, how like society should be but it takes like ages to, to to get built you know to get all the permission all the thing so and then i understood that like doing something which is in between art and architecture uh, environmentalism and thing was much easier for me to communicate uh you know this idea of future I have. so because when you are an artist you are also your own developer right so you put the money up front you build the prototype you build the the, the piece and you try to, to to sell it and to to show to the people and then you know that's that's how it works it's much faster you know and yeah i've been uh, as i said i think already repeated like many times i've always been fascinated of this idea of uh, promoting like a, a, a better future, you know, the future that you want to live in, you know, you can be the, the change you want to see in the, in the world. So that's uh, how I became a vegan. That's uh, how I started my like a uh, heart architecture slash architecture project. No, totally. I couldn't agree more. This is, um, for example, I started our podcast I wanted to listen to. <laughs> uh, it's wow. how you do it. That's the right mentality to start doing what you want to have and experience yourself. Um, but like in the early stage, you how do you know uh, Paolo? It's something through university or how did you connect? Did you know? Oh, no, I, like through the internet. I have oh, okay. uh, seen like many of his projects and uh, I decided that I just want to work with him. I want to know this guy. So I went to the to, to his office and uh, that's it. I said, okay, this is my CV. You know, I want to work with you. And uh, yeah, he was like very open. He liked a lot what I was doing. And then we became like uh, immediately friends and yeah, it was wonderful. Nice, nice. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I like this approach that you have this very proactive approach of doing, okay, I want to do this. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm just going to go and uh, um, ask to <laughs> to join. Um, yeah, I also don't want to be stuck in a situation which I which, which I don't like, you know, again, if you've been working on a project for, uh, you know, like that you don't like, I mean, you, all your life you start to, you know, like be, 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 be like, I don't know, uh, hey, you, you, you start to feel uncomfortable, you start to feel unhappy, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I don't want to experience any of this ever. So I just want to do what I want to do you know what i'm happy doing you know i also think it's the way to come up with good things you know if you're happy to do what you do you put you walk the extra mile yeah, that's the only yeah. way you do it so um is it this way also like um like for example one thing that i like about the podcast is not that for example i like my job and i, I like to do uh my my work but it's um, the work has certain amount of constraints that no matter what job you're doing, you have to um, deal with, right? So if you're working on an architectural project, it will be whether the deadline, whether there are some constraints, you're not completely free. Is this your is this side practice you're doing sort of your way of being completely free with your creative skills? Is it something that you use also like to um nurture your creativity on the side in a completely free form 
Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, being a, being an artist means like being like the creative designer, being the developer, and being also the client. You know, you 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 deciding what what you want to do, what you want to say, how you want to do it. You know, uh, so in that sense, yes, it's like the, my way to express myself uh, at what I consider my best, and uh, you know, also to because when you need so great architecture, also great come from great clients. Okay, so that's 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 uh, I think the most important thing. Having like a visionary client is the only way to achieve visionary architecture, right? When you are your own client, uh, you know, then you set the, the goal, you set the target you wanna uh, achieve, you know, and you know you do your own research, you do your own like making of these things, and then you see how you know good these things are. You can like. You know, being on both sides of the the you know this relation like client and uh, and uh, designer, which is like totally fascinating for me. You know, it's what like motivates me to to improve and to to you know to walk this extra mile to ex explore like um, you know some fields that I'm not uh, confident with. You know, or or like target uh, the, like certain aspects of uh, the society of the life. I don't like that much in you know the way we're living and try to uh you know change them yeah visualize the way or like making actually the, the the change so people that are listening and um you can go to also the the website of like cosimo's website it's cosimoscotucci.com you'll find also the link in the description of the podcast um uh, when or to his instagram and um, it's interesting this, this, the kind of projects that you do. They are exactly what you've described so far, more or less. These um, basically concepts of uh, possible alternatives of what um, our world could look like. Um, so on the Instagram, at least, the first available one is not from so much uh, time ago. That's basically from the... Big, yeah, beginning of the pandemic, uh, which is funny because you posted a model for social distancing in mm -hmm. December 28, 2020, which mm -hmm. wasn't the time where the pandemic was already uh, like global. Um, mm -hmm. Well, what about, what about this project, for example? How did you come up with this idea of this project that you wanted to, to design? Yeah, I mean, I've seen like, uh, you know, what the social distancing meant for many people, you know, isolation and, uh, you know, also, um, you know, being like alone or uh, or like, um, you know, separated from the people. So I started asking myself, how can we still have like some good social interaction while moving? Because we've seen a lot of these uh, uh, tapes on the ground, you know, and like way of distancing people, you know, but then the relationship was missing that, you know, the, the, the way that like, you know, people have been like living, uh, you know, it, it was like completely missing. So I asked myself, how can we or can how can I provide the people with like a tool or like instrument or piece infrastructure to let them interact freely, but being safe in a pandemic time? So to me, it was sort of a political act as well, uh, you know, and a social act as well. So, yeah, I and then I came up with this idea so it was uh, mutuated from uh, like astrophysics from uh, Einstein's uh, general rule of relativity and that's it that's basically how you know you can provide people with like some easy way of interacting during a pandemic time and um, what are, like what kind of uh, projects do you do? Because some of the projects that you that I see on your website, they seem to be just like, for example, this one, just a vision that it's like a concept and it, mm, it doesn't seem to be explored until the possible realization. So basically, um, we see the circles of people that walk and there is sort of a heat map on, on the ground and and then when they get closer, of course, the heat map gets uh, darker and when they distance, it gets uh, brighter. But for example, you have also done other um, other um, projects like uh, Space Debris, called this one where you have built sort of this model of, mm -hmm. of these installations. 
uh, when you do a project like this one that it's physically built in some form, um, what is your way of proceed? Do you go with the project and directly um, build a piece? Or do you have the idea, you have like the concepts on paper, you discuss with, I don't know, museums or design weeks or any form of, of venues. And then after you get the green line from them, you build them. Or how do you proceed when the project's involved to have a, some physical piece of the project? Well, I mean, I, I started doing like prototypes and research. So also the physics project you refer to, uh, you know, the, the social distancing uh, tool, is it built in a sense that I have done many prototypes. Uh, so I've been ordering uh, fabrics from all over the world. I've been like trying to combine them, defining like the good uh, technology. So I have like tons of uh, uh, tests in my workshop. Um, and uh, eventually, you know, I even built like some prototype which are like good uh, for a certain scale. So again, I approach this as like a true artist. You know, they usually go to the shop, they buy the canvas, they buy the color, they, you know, they start painting and then they try to sell it. So that's the same way I do. I basically, you know, understood the necessity, you know, seen that it was like a certain necessity to be entered. And then I start questioning myself how to enter it. And then, you know, from there on, it was like practical research, like making, you know. Um, so I have a workshop uh, space in which it's like sort of a lab uh, in which, uh, you know, I have like some certain machine and then I try to, you know, be, like realize, um, you know, all the idea I uh, came up with. So, um, yeah, that's basically, and then you, you start talking there. So you publish this project and then you start that's the moment when it goes public and then you know i start like talking interacting with like possible clients so for instance the the most recent one the stars is uh is a project that uh, i uh, came up uh, by myself you know because uh, i'm involved also in a reinforestation project and i i thought to myself okay what about the existing uh, flora you know what can we do you know to boost nature Right. And then I came up with the idea and then the municipality in Italy was very much interested. And then I start prototyping and then we are now uh, building this in um, in, uh, in the market. And then, you know, Amsterdam uh, also came to me. They want to build a piece. Um, New Hampshire, uh, they also want to be build a piece. So that's how I do. I do the mock-ups. I do the test. I see and I prove that they're working. And then I do talk with all the possible actors, you know, mm -hmm. to build these things. Um, what exactly does this project, the stars? So basically the, the flora, it works like a, a very easily. We all know, you know, that like the sun heats, the, the, the plants absorb a certain part of the radiation. And then, so the green part of the spectrum is reflected. That's why it looks like green. And then the rest is absorbed to do all the, the metabolical processes of you know what like a plant do but then of course like um you know the, the plants in the human made environment in cities you know are like stressed by pollution like noise the you know certain type of lights and basically what they what what these stars uh, aim to is to give uh, the plants the 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 right the right exact um radiation they need to heal themselves to perform better to to be healthier so healthier plants function way better than well, actually function. Like a not healthy plant doesn't punch. So when a plant is too stressed, it can it doesn't produce the oxygen, it doesn't ca capture the CO2 from the atmosphere. So the aim is, you know, to 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 help the nature heal uh, itself and uh, perform better. Mm. And um, when you do this project, which technically, uh, so of course, from the design point of view. It looks really good, but the design has to be combined with this function, which is enhancing the plants. I guess you need some sort of expertise uh, regarding the flora, how it works, what could work. Do you collaborate with experts from the fields of botanics or something like this? Or yeah, for, for every project, I start talking with like you know the people. Uh, so I think my mantra is talk with someone which is smarter than you. Okay, or at least is an expert in something that you are not. 
So that, that's the first thing I do. So I start with like a research, of course, like online research, literature and start reading books and seeing articles online. And then as soon as I figure out, you know, the, the overall system, you know, that I know that this works and then I start talking with the experts in every field, you know, uh, light engineers or, uh, you know, botanical. Um, so, and, and there you, you like tune the project. So you, you understand, you know, what's the right, uh, you know, length wave you need, you know, how much, uh, like what type of light, how close, how far, you know, how long this should be and et cetera, et cetera. So, and yeah, then, you know, you are just like uh, controlling the design, but then you get input from, yeah, people that are smarter than me on certain fields. And um, do you completely come up with the ideas um, by your personal inspiration? Uh, or do you still have like some sort of network of designers and you come up together with these ideas? Like, do you collaborate with other, I mean, a part of the experts that we already mentioned, like, did you, did you decide yourself one day, okay, I want to do something to enhance the plans by doing a design project or did you decide you wanted to, or how do, how these ideas come to your mind? I mean, I, I do look at the, the global uh, threats, like uh, climate change uh, uh, for all or uh, inequality, you know, these kind of things. And I try to come up with design solution to, you know, contribute to a better world. So basically you read the newspaper, you you see that, uh, you know, uh, the, like, I don't know, uh, drought in Italy, it's like very severe right now. So I, I come up with this idea of, you know, taking out the salt from the sea uh water so then like how to come up with because ocean are an immense reservoir of water and then how can we make fresh water from salty water and then i mean apparently it's very easy and uh you know you just like build some dome you just let the sun do what it does at best like shining and that's it and then you get fresh water actually distillated water uh but it could be good for irrigation, drinking, et cetera, et cetera. So I just read newspaper. I just, uh, you know, like talk to people and then try to understand which are like, you know, the, the problems of mm -hmm. this society we're living in and, uh, you know, like come up with some, some good solution to make like the future better. And it's, this is very fascinating and the projects uh, look amazing. Um, yeah. What, um, how do you find the time? I mean, in order to make this project, you need time. Uh, I guess that you don't do this on a short term. You need some um, probably longer term planning. And also you work, I don't know, do you work uh, full time at MVRDV or is it just a part time? You do this in the other part of your time or how do you um, schedule your time in order to be able to work at one of the most cutting edge offices in the world in the field of architecture mm -hmm. and in the meantime doing also some very um, cutting edge, very ambitious project yourself. So yeah, I've been working like four days a week uh, for the past uh, mm -hmm. three, four years. And um, yeah, it's that's, that's basically part of the time I use for uh, my project. And, um, but then I must say also the office is very open uh, for, with the, with the uh, employees to let them express themselves the way they want. So, I mean, there is no restriction. They're very fine to like you doing your uh, side project, uh, you know, on your, of course, uh, uh, spare time. But uh, so in that sense, I, I mean, I never felt like um, like some sort of limit uh, given by the, the office. And yeah, they, they even share the project we do. So like uh, every year we also have like some exhibition inside of the office uh, in which you can like display what you do on your private time. So they're very proud also of this. And yeah, well, I've been like, uh, um, yeah, like working four days a week. And so that was three days was, um, you know, given to my own uh, practice. But then it's also something that, uh, you know, I do like basically every day just thinking about, you know, the problem. So how can we solve cl uh, climate change, global warming? So this is something that you have in the back of your mind every day, whatever you do, you know, wherever you are. And if some, and then you just connect the dots. And sometimes innovation, as you were saying, for the houses uh, project we do, you know, sometimes it's just something that is there, and you just need to put it in a different 
from a different you see it from a different perspective. That's how innovation works. Mm, so, yeah. so basically, yeah, it's something that you have. Um, I mean, I don't believe in uh, talent or uh, epiphany. You know, it's just hard work. Uh, but yeah, so you just start to cross pollinate uh, your um, you know knowledge with people, some uh, people like knowledge from someone else or like the, from and then you start reading about it and then you know neurons somehow do the same thing and you know that's how you get an idea and then you just refine mm -hmm. it and tune it okay. how do you when you develop these concepts of course they're interesting and useful um and you mentioned that then some municipalities or communities um, express interest towards these ideas mm -hmm. um how do you pitch your then ideas to your possible clients how do you yeah, connect I'm... to these possible clients yeah i mean there is a uh... this is also something that you learn by doing so first time uh, i must say you know the 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 way I was communicating my project with, like, you know, people interested in doing it, uh, it wasn't like uh, good enough or it wasn't like the, the right way. But then you just find doing it by doing, you learn from other people. I mean, there is like tons of like books and, you know, like a podcast and, uh, you know, interviews, etc. videos in which like people, they tell how they approach the client and how, you know, you to share your ideas. That's that's basically uh, what they do. It's like a self-made uh, business, in a sense that uh, you know. I know. I mean, I, I I was like completely new. Of course, I learned a lot of things here in MBRTV. You know, how do we communicate with the client? How we you know interact with the client? How we approach the client? So it's something that I also, of course, use on my own uh, practice. But uh, yeah, that's uh, that's just like learning by doing. But uh, what I meant is like, uh, do the clients come to you when they see your idea, or do you send uh, your presentation of the prototype or something to different, um, I don't know, design weeks, or mm -hmm. how do you expose your work in order that somebody shows interest? Because um, yeah, you yeah. you have to generate some reach in order for anyone to be interested into the project at all so yeah most of the time like people approach me so you just publish these ideas on you know the widest uh, um, uh, possible um, let's say uh, group of people you know and then you know you get like approached by people they were interested they just sometimes it's just about knowing what you do or understanding it better but sometimes it's like real business and uh, uh, other time you just apply for uh, uh, like competition or calls with ah with okay teams. okay so, so basically because I saw some of your project were for example spotlighted by big newspapers uh, for example in Italy La Repubblica which is one of the biggest newspapers then some I don't know for example this project the stars I don't know where it was published. Um, do this publication happens naturally or do they or do you seek for them like do you for example send your projects to websites and things so that they can repost them how does it work it works like so you first of all put it on your website and then from there like some people you know just like repost the project that's a, that's a big channel and of course, there are like, uh, you know, some um, like newspaper or like a magazine that, you know, you can send your uh, uh, project to. And then if they're interested in, interesting enough, they just republish. And then, you know, it's like a chain. And then, uh, you know, people keep posting it and uh, reshare it and uh, stuff like that. Or some other time, like a specific newspaper or uh, like a magazine, whatever, and just a send me an email saying like, hey, can you share your uh, material with us? We're very happy to, to publish it. So, and that's, this is basically pretty much like the way I do. So you send, you, you publish, and then you, there are like many websites in which you can publish your ideas and then build like a portfolio. So you do that and then people that are interested, reshare it and then this create like a sort of noise around it. And, uh, you know, you reach what? a lot of people. When did you start with the first project? How long time ago did you start? I mean, a part of yeah, going to work uh, and collaborate with studios, but um, did you start this um, pr 
sort of side practice mm-hmm. since day one you were at MVRDV or after some times you decided to shift to the four uh, days week and uh, then work uh, one day on your personal ideas? Yeah, I mean, it took me a couple of years uh, in the sense that I thought that, uh, you know, working in this office, you could, uh, you know, change uh, the world uh, in a faster and more uh, uh, direct way. Uh, but then again, architecture is its own time, which it's impossible to, to change, you know, no matter where you work, you know, bureaucracy always works at the same speed. And then, then it's when I decided to, you know, invest on this idea I had and saying like, uh, okay, so I'll, I'll do it myself. I build the prototype and then uh, let's see what the world thinks about it. Mm-hmm. You know, and then this started uh, 2019. So when I decided to have like a, I had to, to believe in these ideas and then just change my contract to like a part-time and yeah, let's see what, what, you know, and then I, I think it's like pretty much as a, your, uh, your podcast, a certain point you said, okay, I want to do the podcast and you set a goal, a target. So like, I don't know, I do like a episode per week or, uh, you know, I want to reach like a hundred episodes or thousand or whatever. And then you, you set your, uh, your, your goal and then you just work for it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I the the only difference so far is that I haven't uh, I work full time. So I'm curious. Um, do you need to like uh, in the beginning? I'm guessing for sure. But right now, um, have you reached a point with your side project where the side projects can give you an income that compensates the one day that you don't work? Yes, yes, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, with I mean. And of how- course, there are like certain moments in which I'm like much more able to, um, uh, you know, work on my side project and you know uh, try to sell them uh, more. And then, of course, different ideas lead to different incomes. Like, uh, for instance, like um, you know, the, the, the gigantic dome. Uh, I'm now discussing with a uh, uh, city in uh, Thailand. You know, that is like a gigantic project. You know, and then this is a long-term process, of course because it's like much more close to architecture than uh, art. But then there are, there are some other projects like the stars that you can, I can build very fast. And, um, you know, it's the prototype is done. The, the whole thing is very easy to build. So that thing, you can sell it to different uh, actors in relatively uh, a short time. So that is produce a different type of income. But then if you look at the big picture, yeah, you can, uh, of course, compensate for the the day you uh, are not working at the office, but ideally also to, you know, uh, yeah, make money, money out of it, you know, just like uh, being like a healthy practice. Yeah, for, for me, it's always very important to, you know, like this is not the case, for example, for the podcast yet, but the final aim is to be, make it happen, is to also sh- prove how you um, make um uh, design a product that also generates income uh because mm, if you do it for the pure purpose of just designing something that nobody wants to pay for then on the long term you cannot do it because you won't survive right you have to pay your rent you have to pay your food you have to pay your bills and um yeah that's why for me it's always important to ask also these questions right uh, this is also look very cool, but the, the, like if you find a way to monetize it, it's the real deal. And for example, for a project like this gigantic dome, um, mm-hmm. which is this infrastructure that's supposed to generate uh, fresh water from the oceans, uh, this is like a concept that probably you have done some small uh, prototype that proves it works. Um, what do you sell? to the clients? Do you sell them the concept and they go to a whole team that will develop it? Or do you sell for them like uh, further research? And how do you avoid they take just your project and copy it? Uh, well, I'm not much afraid of uh, uh, copying. Again, I mean, the, the, the goal for me is to, you know, stimulate change. So good for me if someone takes the idea and bring it to a next level. Uh, but uh, so basically, I started this uh, this conversation with the municipality in Thailand, and then the idea is that uh, you know you of course need to 
So that is a concept, it's generic concept. So you need to apply to size specific uh, demands, like in terms of size, liter of water you want to produce, you know, the, the condition, like a weather condition, sociological condition of a specific area. So basically I started a conversation with them and then I hired like a team of uh, engineers. They are behind, you know, the, the, you know, the structural calculation of it and, you know, how much water we can produce, shape, material, et cetera. So, and yeah, I'm developing it as a office. Just what, what your office do like. A, ah, okay. Or, okay. Okay. You're like developing the project further on, but um, I'm interested. So you do, you start the idea alone. So one day you read that there is a problem with water and you say, okay, I want to um, solve the problem of the water. Start with the idea. We have oceans, how we can turn uh, the ocean, the salty water into pure water. You research a little bit scientific principles. Uh, um, build a shape around the, the principle that it's legitimately uh, possible to be built and work um, until what what point of your concept you reach so basically you do these cool renderings where you show the idea and um, and how how this municipality in Thailand for example figure out you have done this project and they came up to you they just contact me on Instagram. Oh, so they saw I, it on Instagram and they say, yes. hey, we are interested in your project. Yes, they sent me a message like, hey, are you up for a call? And then it was like, well, sure thing. And uh, yeah, we had a nice conversation over Zoom. The whole thing started like, is it possible? Is it real? And then I start, I sent them like a document explaining a little bit further the project. And then, uh, you know, they, they got interested in it. And then, yeah, you know, they, they, they kind of put some budget on. So I was able to hire these uh, engineers and, you know, and then things are evolving like face by face. What, was it published somewhere on some magazine or only exclusive on Instagram? No, no, no. It's published. It's like very broadly published. Uh, it got, uh, yeah, pretty much everywhere uh, mm. from, uh, you know, architectural newspaper to or magazines to like general public newspaper and magazines. So, and, and and, and how long time, for example, from the first idea to this level of concept with the renderings, how long time do you generally uh, need for a project to 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 reach this level? Yeah, Different months or weeks or yeah, I know, but what so is your instance, some, some, some it takes like days, you know. Some it's very immediate, and you just like uh, you know understand which is like a good. Uh, you know, thing there is a lot of literature around, and you just like you know dive a little bit and into it, and then you just understand how to do it, and that's it. You know, but then from that moment, you know, the start of like the process of prototyping these things and proving you know that these things are working, that is you know the the biggest uh, time. And then you know you publish it, and you see what the public, uh, uh, how the public react to it. So it highly depends. Sometimes it's like a, just a couple of days, uh, uh, you know, idea. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, months. You know, now I'm, I'm working on um, a project that, you know, the, the thinking of it, it started a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. As, uh, you know, I'm now doing the first prototypes. So it took me like a lot of time to understand the, the, the real, you know, uh, science behind it. You know, to how, it works. how much money do you spend on the prototypes? Uh, all the money I have, basically. All the money you have. So you don't go yeah. to holiday, you don't go to party, you just it's, put everything. I, I, you know, I'm here, you know, working. <laughs> so now, yeah, the, yeah, of course. I mean, I uh, pretty much try to reinvest uh, like, a, you know, this 80-20 uh, rule. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, but, uh, so basically for me, it's a little bit of the hot percent. So I spend the 80% in, uh, research, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, um, yeah, development of, uh, these things. And yeah, I, I, I mean, at the moment, again, I have two things. I have a sure income coming from MBRDB and, uh, I have like my, uh, fluctuating, uh, um, you know, business. So for now I have like. Everything I make on my side project is reinvested in the side oh. project, basically. And and then your gig at MVRDV is basically keeping your 
safe for the future, so to say. Yeah, yeah. For now, for now, yes. For now, yes. But they also, I mean, the income is balanced for the time I spend on the project. So I spend like four days a week in MBRDV, and uh, you know that's uh, where like the big chunk of uh, uh, my money come from. And you know I do spend like some time in my uh, you know side project that that's uh, has a different uh, balance, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, I mean, I'm just curious because it's important, as I told you, for me, it's very important to understand how you make uh, things realistically feasible. But I mean, I uh, have to say I admire a lot because uh, you basically are 80% guided by the aim of making a better world and 20% by the money you can make out of it. Because uh, again, that's a proof of it. Um, and the projects are really interesting and um, I can imagine, uh, yeah, that it's, uh, but it's also, I can imagine that now you're very, very trained into thinking like what could be another idea because I can imagine in the beginning, so you said in the beginning you were talking about, for example, building better uh, urban uh, furniture that maybe it's fun for people to use and then you move from uh, something that's fun to something that's actually useful based on your moral guides and uh, this is this is awesome i mean like uh, that sounds really really cool yeah thanks thanks no I, like i didn't this is the beauty of this conversation is that if i were to read an article about your project i would see the images and i would be like yeah, it's like another cool rendering of a dome in the middle of the ocean or some balloons that light up in the evening in the wood. And that would be cool. But talking to the person and understanding the story behind, the process behind, uh, I think it's much more interesting and much more powerful because some other people can hear and some other people that have your own values can work towards this same mm -hmm. objective and um, and maybe create other projects that you don't have the time to create. And talking about time to create projects, how many projects can you handle at a time? Do you always work on one project at a time? Or do you need sometimes to, for example, now you, we mentioned the stars, we mentioned the mm -hmm. dome, and you're a single person. Do you need to split also between different projects that go, go along together? Yeah, yeah. So, for instance, the dome and uh, and uh, the stars were like uh, um, like built in uh, uh, simultaneously. So I was like doing research on both things, and uh, of course, this create delays in the, in the in the process. Uh, but yeah, so the stars started even before the dome, but the dome got published first because the research behind was much in a way simpler. Uh, you know, the principle behind was a uh, way um, yeah faster to prove. So, so for this, as I was saying, like I'm working on this other project, uh, the heat map, um, yeah, since a year and a half. So whatever mm -hmm. you've seen, I published in this year and a half is probably, you know, been, uh, uh, you know, this same time as this other research I'm doing, but yeah, it depends on, you know, how, how, how difficult it is to prove the concept, right. And mm -hmm. sometimes it, it's not. So I just like give up on that idea. You know, you just like test, you see if it's not scientifically proved, you just abandon it and you move on and you start thinking of something else. You know, sometimes just changing the medium or, you know, reusing one thing on, on, on another project that like make it uh, work. Mm -hmm. And um, how, how did you test, for example, the idea of this dome? Like, what was your prototype? Was it like a small dome? It was a small dome, so it was uh, one of these uh, like glass dome, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, just I put like in a plate with water, and then I just let the the the, the sun do the the work. The work. And Did then you, you put salt in the water? Yes, of course. And okay. then you see it at the end, you know, it's it's there on the plate. How long? And, I mean, how, how long did it take you? Well, that that the, at the very beginning it took me a long to understand how much water should I put in. You know that was the the big part, but then you can you know uh, accelerate this uh, this process with like of course uh, uh, you know some fire. So if you when you cook pasta, you know that's uh, that's basically how it works. You know, yeah. and then you have this uh, the, the, the you know the 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 the, the glass uh, caps. 
you know, and then you see it and the principle is the same. And then if you leave it the, the pan on too much on the, on the, on the fire, you know, you will see all the salt at the very base, right? Mm -hmm. So no more than uh, making like a pasta. But the difference is how do you make the water condense again in another place that it's not back down in the salt? Yeah, but then you basically the dome itself has, you know, the, by, by, by gravity, you know, the, the water is pushed all the way to the edge. So just building like a sewage system on the edge that you can collect it. And oh, then you so can, that's like, like the, the, the things you see in the rendering. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So and basically the water evaporates and then it condenses on the glass shell up. And then it like slides all the way down into like a sewage system, and then you just condense it mm. wherever you want. Ah, see, interesting. And it's all like energy free. It's just the sun do the work. Cool. Uh, it sounds very awesome. It, your your kind of projects now that I think it reminds me of um, my interview with uh, Sinus Lunge from Effect Architects where he told me the story about how they became so famous. And then he said they did one project that was, I think, a concept project for uh, Ideal Village with all the glass houses for farming. That was episode 50 of the, epi of the podcast. And then that project went viral because people loved it so much. And this is how Effect had his own biggest uh, growth because that project was so so famous and they did lately this year in the, or last year i don't remember anymore the venice biennale they did i don't know if you saw those uh, mini project of the forest one uh, so I, I uh it reminds me a lot of of that approach um yeah. but they're definitely very interesting uh, definitely very interesting um have you focused completely yourself on the uh, creating these projects or have you also like done a little bit you, you said you've learned some things from just working at mvrdv but um, there are a lot of side things that are not directly related to to the creative side of a project like yours like i don't know building a company doing tax returns stuff like that so this is all the annoying parts um have you educated yourself somehow with books or any other form of education about business marketing and things like that or you just um, decided you're gonna start your small company and make projects and figure out along the way no no yeah little by little you need to uh, dive into the, these things so i uh, somehow for for certain uh, uh, type of uh, thing i do rely on experts like uh, you know tax return you know that's something that i i don't dare to do no, uh, so I just, mm. uh, you know, pay someone who does it for me. And uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, but then for other things, yes, you have a lot of literature about, uh, you know, how you can sell your ideas and, uh, you know, for marketing uh, purposes. And you do a little bit of research, you see what other people do. And, uh, you know, you start learning from there. You try to get into, you know, a certain network that allow you to understand and ask these questions to other people. Because people are very happy to share, you know, that's, uh, that's the thing. And just ask when you don't know, I just ask, you know, I just like, send email, random, random email to like other people. Or when you meet a person, you just like, ask this thing. Some of the time you just fail and then you learn that that was the, the right way to do these things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and then you start over again and you next time you do it better or at least you do it differently and you see if it's better or not. And um, one another thing that comes to my mind that I've heard already on the podcast, and uh, uh, I had the guy from Brick Visuals, um, Andras Kaltos, and he told me that when they were starting Brick Visuals, their their office uh, it got the biggest grow when they actually hired a salesperson. It was the business person of the office, and then that pushed. Uh, the office to growth which is for him important have you been thinking that at some point maybe you need also to put someone on the team that exactly take care of the business of these ideas because they are, in my opinion have very big potential but uh, of course you are a person uh, alone you don't have <laughs> you have that limited amount of hours so mm -hmm. is it for you maybe an idea for the future at some point to Absolutely. also have a business person that take care of marketing the 
the products you design. No, absolutely, absolutely. That's uh, that's the first thing. So someone who knows uh, how to do like a proper business plan to develop, like a, you know how to that they understand, you know how to communicate these ideas better, to sell these ideas better, to you know, um, yeah. So to me, like a business uh, um, development person, it will be like crucial, and I guess also like someone who does yeah real communication, like a PR. You know mm -hmm. that these are the two like uh, figures that I think are essential for our office, like beside the, the creative uh, uh, people, but also here at the office. So we have about 200 architects and uh, like 100 people that support these architects uh, uh, to do their work. You know, financial department, BD department, PR department, like every possible HR. So all these people are fundamental to run an mm -hmm. office. I mean, I, I, I I do know how to, you know, do like I have ideas. I don't know how to, you know, but it's something that you try to steal from other, that you understand from other, you, you like trying to learn, you know, how to communicate your ideas, how to have like your uh, social media presence, how you have your, uh, you know, the, the channel communication, where you want to have your project published or not. So this is things that I do think myself, that I do try to, you know, um, make clear for me as well you know it's something that i need to decide where i want my public public just published you know which are the it's again you know a somehow a, a political act again you know it's like uh you know the client you work with you go we work to or for uh or you know that's that's the thing so you need to make this decision clear but then it would be great to have someone who has uh you know expertise on the field and i think you cut a lot of time you cut a lot of effort you like lose way uh less money on it you know it's just again rely on expert people that know more than you do you know this is uh, my mantra again maybe i got some inspiration for you i'm gonna share with you after the interview <laughs> I'll love to hear. so that people will be curious and will uh, stay tuned to your website and uh instagram page and so on um no but it's uh, very inspiring what you do and i'm personally very impressed and uh, i have to thank you ricardo for this good tip to have this uh, very interesting um conversation and uh to have had the opportunity to get to know you and now you're becoming a very few like a bigger number of people that are based in rotterdam so i guess that next year i'll be forced to take the train Come over yeah, and do a little tour of the different uh, guests that live in Rotterdam. And, absolutely, absolutely. But also feel free to 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 you know to inter interconnect each other. You know that would be amazing. You know, just uh, come over and then we all have we we crack a beer together. Yes, uh, exactly. This is this is the plan. Uh, uh, you, I try to always uh, finish the podcast in a very, um, how do you say, proactive way for people that have been listening. Uh, and I ask this question to build this uh, melting pot of uh, creative ideas, inspiration ideas. And I ask always if you could share with uh, me and the people who are listening, uh, maybe your favorite uh, uh, movies, books, uh, podcasts, uh, it doesn't have to be one of each or but something that or sports activity that you like to do when you want to get inspired uh, although from the conversation i think you have a lot of ideas and a lot of inspiration but i guess that as everyone else sometimes you have also some downtime that you want to spend by consuming something inspiring so what what could be that for you so i'm an obsessive reader so i do read uh, 40 to 50 books a year so I have a long list of books. If you want, we can, uh, you know, make another hour of podcast. I guess. <laughs> with that. No, you just shared the the first that come to your mind, like the first few that you just right away that you think. So I think like fundamental literature for everybody is the Harari trilogy. You know, *Sapiens: Twenty One Lesson for the Twenty First Century* and *Homo Deus*. It's like fundamental uh, operating manual for spaceship hurt. Back if you back if you learn. You know, for architect, that's uh, that's amazing. Elizabeth Colbert, uh, she's an amazing writer. Uh, the Sixth Engine and Under White Sky, strongly suggested. Um, How Innovation Work, uh, Matt Ridley. It's a wonderful book if uh, you're interested in innovation, how things started, and uh, um, yeah, like these, like, 
And then to me, there is also another level of books that everyone must read. Like uh, if this is a man, Primo Levi, uh, Green Barrett's uh, Gino Strada, or uh, I don't know, uh, Colima Stales, uh, uh, Varlam Shlamov. These are like things that human beings must know, you know, like uh, beside architect or creative people. So this is things that everybody should have read. That's a very good uh, suggestion or a very good list. Uh, maybe I'll just put them in a written form so that uh, we can add this as a, also another resource from this podcast. Well, Cosimo, thank you very much for this conversation. And I always say this doesn't have to be your only appearance of the Creative Insider podcast. Maybe in a few months when some projects have moved on, we can come back and then maybe discuss specifically specific topics. And um, thank you very much for your time and for being on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was uh, amazing to yeah share, you know, have this conversation. Thank you. Bye-bye and have a good weekend. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye.